I was six years old when my parents divorced. I didn't understand why my dad moved out, remarried, and became a dad to someone else's kids. The next seven years were somewhat traumatic. I remember the police being involved with domestic disputes, being dragged down to the courts at the Daily Center regarding child support and custody issues, uh, living with my grandparents, uh, as well as going to different schools. I give my mom a lot of credit for raising me and my younger brother uh, on her own as a Chicago public school teacher. It's one of the reasons that I have so much respect for single moms. I share this story, this personal story, which I've never really spoken about before, not for pity, but to emphasize the point that father absence isn't some abstraction. It's not just an inner city issue. It's real, and its impact can be generational. In fact, father absence knows no gender, geographic, or socioeconomic boundaries. It exists in urban, suburban, and rural communities across America and around the world. For the record, and I thank God for this, I was very fortunate to have a father figure, my grandfather, Sam Solomon, my maternal grandfather. What I'd like to talk with you about this evening is why we need to break the cycle of father absence. We're going to look at one of the root causes, the very heart of what else society, and that is the story of the missing father. Where did he go? And most important, what is the price of his absence to his children? and more widely to society. So I first became aware of this issue in the fall of 1996. I was 36 years old, and we had just had our fifth child in seven years. I was working full time and finishing up a three-year commitment with the W.K. Kellogg Foundation. And as the fellowship was winding down, I was feeling a lot of pressure at home and some at work due to the nine months that I had committed over the prior three years. I was determined to redirect a good portion of my time and energies to being a better father as well as husband. But the real reason I was seeking fatherhood resources was fear. Fear that I wouldn't have a strong relationship with my kids. Fear that history would repeat itself. Fear that this issue of father absence would somehow undermine my relationship with my kids like it did with me and my dad, and it did with my dad and his dad. This uh, old suitcase is a metaphor for the baggage of father absence that's been handed down by generations in my family. And I, I set as my goal to not pass this baggage down to my kids. So when I was looking for fatherhood resources, I was introduced to Dr. Ken Canfield, author of Heart of the Father, and founder of the National Center for Fathering. Dr. Canfield explained that there's four out of 10 or some 24 million kids growing up in father absent homes. He also went on to say that there's some 500,000 kids born every year without a dad's name on their birth certificate. Consider that in the 18 minutes it takes to give a TED presentation, there's 145 youth born in the United States. If nothing changes, 58 of them are gonna grow up in father absent homes. That translates into three per minute, 193 per hour, and a jaw-dropping 4,640 born every day who grew up in father absent homes. What type of experience can they expect? Children from father absent homes are four times more likely to grow up in poverty, nine times more likely to drop out of high school. Sadly, there's more than 3,200 youth that drop out of high school here in the U.S. every day. Pathetically, the United States ranks number 22 out of the 27 developed countries for the percentage of youth that graduate from high school. 71% of the youth who drop out of high school are from father absent homes. 75% of all the crimes committed in the U.S. are committed by high school dropouts. 85% of the youth that are incarcerated also come from father absent homes. There's a perception that this issue of father absence is confined to the inner city as well as minorities. And it's true that father absence does strike a very high percentage of minorities. But the fact of the matter is, the absolute numbers are two times the number of 
white versus black, and one and a half times the number of white versus Latino kids are growing up in father absent homes. Our culture has been shifting away from marriage and families for decades. The pressure from these cultural changes is mounting. Consider that in 1971, the percentage of pre-marriage births was 11%. Today, it's 41%. Before I met Dr. Canfield, I was totally unaware of this issue and the impact of father absence. As it turns out, no one else that I knew had any idea of the scope or scale of the problem either. I was compelled to take action and did so by organizing a community leaders briefing in February of 1997. I invited Dr. Canfield and a handful of others to speak. We were pleased that 120 leaders attended, affirmed the message about the need for more involved fathers, and the Illinois Fatherhood Initiative, the country's first statewide not-for-profit father organization, was born. So in March, with the assistance of the Chicago Public Schools, the State Board of Education, Office of Catholic Education, IFI collected more than 30,000 essays from students first through 12th grade who wrote these authentic, heartfelt essays about what their father meant to them. Fathers, stepfathers, grandfathers, and father figures. Each student was presented with a certificate of participation and encouraged to share their essay with their dad. In April, we scrambled to recruit 400 volunteers to help evaluate these essays. Men and women, young and old, those with means and without, to help evaluate the essays with the purpose of picking just four to be recognized at the Cubs baseball game on Father's Day. The message received back from these 400 volunteers was so powerful that in May, we decided to reprint 24 of the essays, two per grade, in the children's handwritten words so that they would be shared with a wider audience. We printed and sold and distributed 5,000 copies of this essay booklet entitled What My Father Means to Me. I'd like to share just an excerpt or two from some of the essays. As you're listening, imagine you're one of the fathers whose child has written this essay about you. The first is Brittany, sixth grade. I know that I can always count on him to be there for me. He isn't even my father. He's my stepfather, Bill. Thanks to Bill, I know what having a father feels like. Sadly, I know that there are children who will never feel, never experience this feeling. The second is um, Donna in 11th grade. For years, I've been a foster child. I've never known the love a father and a daughter share. There was no one there to help me with school. There was no one there to help me at all. As a child, I had no one to look up to. I had no one to call dad. I have a dad now. He took in a girl who had nowhere to go. Not only was she a stranger, she was a stranger with a past. She was me. He has stood with me through moments of hell. He gave a girl on the brink of death a chance to experience life. I call him dad. The next thing we knew, Harpo Studios was interested in having seven of the students read their essays for a special father's program to air in June. And bam, there I was on the Oprah Winfrey show, along with my 89-year-old maternal grandfather being interviewed by Oprah. This year, in just a month, we got 30,000 essays from kids all over the state. Talking about their dad? Yeah, writing essays on what their dad means to them. That's how you begin to role model for the rest of the men, is you show the people who are getting it right, don't you think? David? Oh, yeah. Come on. I owe a debt of thanks to Dr. Canfield for educating and inspiring me uh, to get involved. Uh, the big takeaway from the essay contest experience and the book, Dr. Canfield's book, was that the most direct way to reach the heart of a father is through the words of his children. The past 18 years, IFI, an all-volunteer organization with almost no overhead, has collected over 400,000 essays, engaged 600 to 800 volunteers annually, raised over $4 million to support the cause, 
uh, without federal funding. The anthropologist Margaret Mead said, the supreme test of any civilization is whether or not it can teach men to be good fathers. So what does it mean to be a good father? By society's definition, it boils down to a dad meeting his financial obligations. So if a dad pays his child support, he can renew his driver's license and his wages won't be garnished. But consider this paradox. Time is what kids say they want and need from their dads. But if a father is unemployed and unable to make his child support payments, he's labeled a deadbeat dad. Access to his kids is denied, and the unintended consequence is even a greater level of father absence. The quarter truth and broken narrative that we've been led to believe is that financial support is the only thing that single moms need. But in truth, what children need are responsible fathers to be there physically, emotionally, and spiritually for them. So let's take a little bit deeper dive on what it means to be a great dad. There are four attributes that all great dads possess. Commitment, honesty, love, and patience. Team Dad felt so strongly about these four attributes, they put them on the face of the great dad's coin, a military-style challenge coin used to honor dads. Now thousands of men carry these coins with them as a token of their commitment to their children as well as fathering. In deference to our limited time, let's just talk about commitment. Commitment is being there 24-7, never giving up, and doing whatever it takes. You know the old adage, if you can't stand the heat and get out of the kitchen. Well, sadly for too many men, they've not only left the kitchen, they've left the house and they haven't returned. We need more dads to make this type of commitment. Bottom line, I need to be with my children. And I'll do anything to do that. You just tell me what to do. All joking aside, there are real life dads making an extraordinary commitment to go way up and above. These are the real everyday heroes. Consider the case of Dick Hoyt, a retired lieutenant colonel in the Air National Guard, whose son Ricky, now 53, was diagnosed shortly after he was born as a spastic quadriplegic with cerebral palsy, unable to walk or talk. Against the advice of institutionalizing him, uh, he was raised at home, attended public school, and eventually learned how to communicate using a special computer. When he was 15, Ricky wanted to participate in a 5K. His dad, who was not a runner, pushed his son the entire distance in his wheelchair. After the race, Ricky said to his dad, Dad, this is the first time in my life I didn't feel handicapped. That experience, and, and uh, four decades later, uh, Ricky and his dad have participated in more than a thousand races, including dozens and dozens of marathons, and remarkably, six Ironman triathlons. So what can we do? What needs to change? If we could only do one thing, it would be to get fathers involved in the educational lives of their kids. Research shows that when both parents are involved, educational outcomes go up dramatically. In other words, greater father involvement equals greater student achievement. There are a couple of obstacles, though. Generally speaking, most men don't like to be told what to do, and we're not good at asking for directions when we're lost. This inclination of not seeking advice or direction, when combined with something more consequential like fathering, creates an, a major obstacle for solving the problem. I'm really impressed with the resource that the 21st Century Dead Foundation committed. It's a self-assessment tool. Where in the privacy of his own home or office, and in less than 30 minutes, a father can get some immediate feedback on his fathering and reflect on what the assessment has to say and resolve to do something in the lives of his children. Here are three examples of organizations doing extraordinary work in the area of father and fathers in education. The Million Father March is an annual demonstration each fall where fathers demonstrate their commitment to their children by accompanying them to school on the first day. Now more than a million fathers participate annually in more than a thousand communities. Watchdogs 
Dads of Great Students provides dads with an opportunity to volunteer in their child's school. Now more than 250,000 dads in more than 4,700 schools participate annually. And the National Center for Fathering Fatherhood Essay Contests um, provide students with an opportunity to improve their writing skills as well as honor their dads. Nearly a million kids have shared their heartfelt words with their fathers. What happens when dads are involved in their children's education? High school graduations go up dramatically, providing more students with an opportunity to attend college and become more productive members of society. Teen pregnancies go down, which means fewer abortions as well as fewer kids raising kids. Teen suicide go down with the incidence of other mental illnesses. And drug and alcohol abuse also goes down, which means fewer lives lost to these horrible addictions. We need to make father involvement a social norm for all the children. Breaking the cycle of father absence is one of the most challenging things that exists. Tackling that problem is going to require a full commitment. For men with children, seek opportunities to enhance your level of commitment and involvement, especially in the area of education. For men without kids, help bridge the gap. Help heal these wounded hearts. Consider mentoring older youth and tutoring younger ones as well as adoption. For women with children, make every effort to involve the father or the child and surround your child with other adult male role models. For women without children, especially young women, um, make yourself fully aware of the implications of becoming a single mom. And for the sons and daughters of all ages, share your heartfelt words with your dad and honor him as well. I'd mentioned earlier that my primary father figure growing up was my grandpa Sam. And what I admired most about my grandfather was his lifetime commitment to service. This picture was taken uh, shortly before he passed away at age 93. There's a quote that I read at my grandfather's funeral 14 years ago by Ralph Waldo Emerson, which is simply, who you are, speak so loudly, I can't hear what you're saying. There's a simple truth. We all make time for what's important. We all get the same 24 hours, no more, no less. The decision of how we invest or spend our time is a very personal one. But it's time to make father involvement a reality for all children. In closing, it's my hope that the enduring legacy of our generation will be that we recognize the impact of father absence and we took the time to do something about it. Thank you.